So three, two, one, and we're on. So first and foremost, I uh, just want to thank you for coming on the show. I greatly appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, yeah no worries. Uh, so I was going to ask you, where are you located at? So I live in Atlanta, Georgia, but um, I just moved here last August. So I'm originally from like Apex, Raleigh, North Carolina area. Okay. And I lived there um, my whole life until I, I moved to Georgia uh, last almost a whole year ago. So wow. what, what brought you over to Atlanta? Well, I was I just kind of wanted to move, you know, my whole family was, lived in North Carolina our whole life. But um, I also for work, I travel a lot. I'm not I'm not a flight attendant, but I do travel <laughs> weekly. Everyone always uh -huh. asks me a flight attendant now. Um, I do travel weekly. So Delta Hub is in Atlanta mm -hmm. and it just makes it especially for prep, you know, uh, yeah. the direct flights are so much easier. Like when I was in North Carolina, I was getting home at like midnight you know, because oh, I would terrible. have layover. Yeah, yeah, I would have layovers, and then like the drive home from the airport. So, I, now I get home at like seven or eight o'clock. I can still hit the gym if I need to on my way home. Yeah, and it's just it's a lot nicer. It's yeah, a lot yeah. nicer for work. Yeah. Yeah. Did you? I was actually just in Atlanta not that long ago. Um, are, are you? Did you get a chance to uh, see the Chicago Pro? Were you there? I didn't. I didn't go. Um, I would say I was. I was a bit burnt out. Um, actually, after I went to Cali, the battle in the desert. I literally, the next, when I got home, the next day I flew out to Miami for work and then I went to Birmingham for work and then I came back and I was just a little tired. I did watch it. I watched the live, uh, the pay-per-view, but I wasn't able to get over there this yeah. year. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's understandable. It's a, it's a, it, it's like going to a show is also almost like mentally fatiguing as well. Oh yeah, so for, sure. A, for sure. For sure. It's watch almost like it. being in the show. You know? Right. <laughs> Yeah, that's absolutely. funny so i mean i'm gonna ask you but you don't have to answer uh is so what do you do you're not like a like an assassin are you or anything like that traveling <laughs> yeah everyone says you must be like some secret <laughs> agent no i'm not a, i'm not a secret agent i'm not that special um i'm a senior clinical research associate um so i work on clinical trials so any like new drug coming to the market that you know they're going through their trials just like you know the covid vaccine is doing mm -hmm. right now um i uh, help monitor those trials so i basically go on site where they're they're conducting these trials and mm -hmm. make sure the doctors are running the you know study prayer protocol the subject safety and efficacy and just that so, kind of way so you work for so that's really interesting actually uh you work for uh this is a company that does this like yeah so it's kind of a, a lot to it but basically you know a sponsor will create this compound or medical device right Mm -hmm. And then they'll contract out a contract research organization, which is what I work for. I work for mm -hmm. a contract research organization um, and they'll basically help run this trial for the drug they created with the Got protocol it. they also wrote, 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 I should say. So, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. So what, so what do you, um, and you know, since I'm not in your field, like I don't want to yeah. tell you what to talk about or not, but um and let me know if you can't talk about it or whatnot, but what do you think about um, like the vaccine, um, the fact that, yeah. it's, you know, some people are saying, well, it's not FDA approved. It's just for emergency use. Like, what does that all mean? You know? Right. So, you know, when you have a clinical trial, actually, like I'll even give an example, um, mm -hmm. like if a baby's born with some rare condition and it happens to be a drug on trial, but not on the market yet, there's emergency scenarios where that's the last best case scenario they can do mm -hmm. is use this trial. So they get this emergency bypass. They'll use this drug that's in a trial for that situation. Right. right. And it could save their life. And I've actually seen it where they, they let it bypass. Like first example, if a baby was born with an emergency situation and they use this drug, it helped mm -hmm. them in the same token is COVID. Right. So this is an emergency, you know, situation that we are calling it, um, you know, worldwide pandemic. Mm -hmm. What I will say is this, um, for one to each their own, you know, we are, we are Americans, you know, we have that freedom. Um, I do respect other people's opinions and thoughts on it. I'm actually funny that you asked, I just started on a COVID-19 trial. So, um, oh, wow. the one I'm on, the one I'm on is for the gastrointestinal symptoms that people are having. Mm -hmm. So, um, anyways, you know, when it was deemed a worldwide pandemic, every lab in the world was working on the vaccine. So when I say, yes, I trust it. I don't mean I trust it for everybody, but I trust that there was so much work and so many people and so many labs involved mm -hmm. that yes, yes, it is, you know, a suitable vaccine, maybe not for every population. 
Right, right. So like, there's obviously so which I guess, like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but what you're saying is like, there's it, enough research has gone into it to to equal like, you know, other kinds of vaccines, like this wasn't just thrown together, but right. But at the same time, there are certain processes that it didn't go through. It hasn't gone through yet. Uh, yep. So technically, you know, when you have a, tr- a drug on market, it goes through four phases. Okay. And, and I don't know, to be honest with you, but I feel like most of the vaccines before they were released were in phase two, which is a smaller population. Like for example, like it could be anywhere from like five to 15 subjects, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, and that's how they, but with COVID, they, increase their population because it was a world pandi- worldwide pandemic. Um, you know, so one thing I will say is this, I think the perfect candidate for the COVID-19 vaccine is the healthiest human. Because when you have a, re- when you're researching, right? When you're researching, mm-hmm. you're putting a drug through a trial, there's all the, you're stratifying different things, uh, age, sex, um, uh, like first, for example, if they have, you know, in the, uh, any underlying like respiratory issues or any underlying, you know, mm-hmm. um, autoimmune diseases, they haven't, that's where we need more, for me, more data right, to make right. it suitable for specific populations, right? Yeah. So what's interesting is that like, so this is a different way that they're creating this vaccine, right? It's basically through this mRNA process where they're, where right. they're, it expresses the protein that then yep. allows it to build like antibodies. So right. if there are problems, like what, what kind of problems could something like that cause? Like what could antibodies to it is, is it, because you're not technically getting the virus. So like what, what issues could come up on that? I know I've heard like people right. say like blood clots, possibly like, you know. Right. Um, so, you know, it's different for everyone. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, you are technically be, being given a strain of the virus. Oh, so you, you are. Know, okay. Yeah. So, you know, even like when you get the flu vaccine, you're, you're, that's how they enter, they give you a small portion of the virus. Right, so basically right. your body learns to fight this virus right? right okay so that's kind of the process of what this vaccine is supposed to do mm-hmm. um to be completely honest with you i i don't know and i have not researched mm-hmm. enough to know the um, repercussions if you know it wasn't going through properly like you know the MR- mrna breakdown and all that stuff i know we use rna to analyze you know specific you know things um when they're given a, a you know a vaccine mm-hmm. um um, and that's how we determine like um, different okay. different things that we're trying to you know figure out. Is this one perfect for someone who has the gastrointestinal issues? Is this one better for someone that has respiratory issues? Mm-hmm. Whatever. Or if they get COVID and they have those issues, you know, what is best for them? Right. You know. Yeah. And so, how long, right? You know, how long it's staying in their system? How long? You know, when they need to get it again? Right. And that's the like that's the thing that I was just talking to someone about this, about how like initially we really wasn't talked about whether you're gonna need another shot or anything like uh, that. But yeah. now that the virus is, or that the vaccine, I should say, has been out for oh, quite some time, that conversation is coming back up. Like Absolutely. You know, do you need a is this gonna be like every six months, every year? And since COVID doesn't have a season, um you know, it's like, you know, it's 12 months out of a year. It's not like the flu, right. you know? So yeah, those are, those are questions that I guess are still. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that that's, again, another point that you're making where there needs to be more research, you know, yeah. where we don't have it hundred percent sound to mm-hmm. where, you know, for the flu vaccine, you get it once a year, you're good to go. Um, yeah. You know, and the, in the same token, right. You're having people that have had that COVID got the vaccine, got COVID again. So those are like other things that, you know, we're trying to figure out why, you know, right, for example, right. what, what in that person made them susceptible to getting it again? Like how, why didn't it work? Like, is it a different strand of COVID that we're not protecting them from? Like whatever the case may be. So, right. right. Yeah. And, the, and I guess like you just brought up another, you know, point, the variants, the variants are, a, mm-hmm. you know, huge, huge problem, right? Because you, you create a vaccine that all of a sudden the variant uh, comes around and, and nullifies like that kind of, I, although Absolutely. they say, they say it, it works. I don't know. Like, you know, it's hard to know who to listen to. I know that Israel just did um, 
uh, some research because they're primarily Pfizer, and they said that they uh, only thirty nine percent was was uh, right. against the Delta variant. So right. So yeah. Yep. So that's what that's what we're coming against right now. Um, you know, we're having different. You know, again, different states having you know a surge in this Delta virus, and that's mm -hmm. what we're kind of looking at too. Like, what's the difference? from like what we were experiencing in 2020, mm -hmm. you know, symptom wise and all of, of these things, um, how susceptible are people to, you know, getting this strand, you know, and, and what makes like each, you know, location a hotspot too, yeah. you know? Right. So. Yeah, that is true, right? Because it's like, sometimes you'll see different spikes and it's like, just to the naked eye, it, it, it doesn't right. make sense. Like why are right. all of a sudden now it's spiking and, you know, in this other area, it's not at all. And right. so, yeah, yeah. so you're, um, so you're currently working on something with regard to, you said, a di digestive issues, like, or. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, being a bodybuilder, is kind of funny because, you know, we have no barriers mm -hmm. and I fortunately, unfortunately am on a study that is all around basically poop. <laughs> you know, like they have to literally for 15 days bring in poop samples. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I mean, I'm not kidding. Like that yeah, is literally yeah. what it is about. Hey, I mean. So, uh, um, that, yeah, so there's people that have, you know, dealt with the gastrointestinal issues. And then you also have to make sure, you know, they don't have maybe IBS or Crohn's mm -hmm. or something else that's giving those gastrointestinal issues. Right. You know, it's, it's but, interesting. But this has been in regard, if I'm not mistaken, to, to having this, COVID. To having COVID. So it's like, yes. if you. So, so yep. go ahead. If you uh -huh. have it, if you have COVID and you have these gastrointestinal sy symptoms within the inclusion exclusion criteria, you can be a part of this trial. Okay. So, and what's the trial? And again, only, you know, say what you can. What's the trial of? Is this a medication that they're trying out? Is yep. this a vaccine? Actually, yep. It's a, it's a medication and actually is a medication from, I think, is back in the 1800s. We, we used it. I'm not going to say the drug uh, just sure, because I don't know if that's allowed. But it was used for a different indication, and now they're trying to repurpose it, which you'll see a lot like Botox, right? Mm -hmm. Botox had a positive symptom, and they realized, you know, we can use it for our face or right. whatever the case right, may right, be. Right, you know, right. it's one of those scenarios we're trying to see if it also has a positive um, response in um, these COVID patients. So yeah. it is just a, it's just a pill. So yeah, so the, so it's not so it's not a drug that's necessarily new. This is like a repurposing. Mm -mm. Of, yep, absolutely. Like, okay, absolutely. Okay. Yep. Interesting. It sounds like you're going to be involved in a lot of these kinds of COVID research. The way it's looking, you know. Yeah, well, I hope hope not because yeah. not my it's not it's not something I um I'm passionate about, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I like um there's other indications I'm more passionate about. I've been on several different trials and. Mm -hmm that I've never been on a vaccine study. So this is actually just a new learning experience mm -hmm. for me too. So that's kind of cool, but um, we'll see what happens. You know, yeah. I'm never, I never knock anything down. Yeah. What do you think? Um, and, you know, just in your opinion, do you think this is something that's gonna, you know, we're going to have to just deal with for, you know, a long time to come? Do you think, do you see an end to COVID or is this something, again, we're just going to have to yeah. learn how to live with? It's hard to say um, because you like, you know, we see our, our senior strand you know, uh, you know, rise, rise above, above, like what we didn't think would happen. Um, but I, I think much like, you know, in the past, we've had, you know, uh, different outbreaks of, you know, of um, different kinds of, you know, you know, things similar yeah. to COVID. And, you know, we've definitely made it past it, you know, to some degree. Sure. Sure. Um, but I do think, I kind of feel like it'll be more along the lines of like what the flu is like, you know, right. um, that's what I see it being. Um, I think right now we just didn't really know how to operate with it. Uh, we all just freaked out. And I mm. think that the freaking out caused us to not really get ahead of the game as mm -hmm. much as we could have. Um, but I think it'll be more so like the flu than anything else so because you know good. it is very similar to the flu you know it has right. much, much like the symptoms right. you know it's a strand that's in the you know in the air per se but um i think um yeah i think it can be it die i think it can die down right, you know right. die down for sure yeah, so, so we can kind of bring it, you think it, it can be brought under like control, so to speak, you know? Yeah, I think so. I think um, mm -hmm. once, you know, we have more data collected on, you know, different, you know, different areas that we're looking at, you know, like I said, there's so much you look at when you look at a vaccine, you have to remember every human's different, right? Yeah. Our, our, our health is at different levels 
for different, you know, for different systems, you know, our organs right. and all of that stuff. Right. So you just have to, we have a lot to look at in that regard, sure, you know, just, sure. just like the flu, you know, there's people that die from having the flu vaccine. There's people that get the flu vaccine, still get the flu. I mean, right. it's, yeah, there's, man. there's never a hundred percent clearance. You right, know. right. And that's kind of like the issue that you have, right? Because you have like people coming out and statistics coming out and saying, well, this person took the vaccine and they died, or this person took the vaccine and they were fine, or this person took the vaccine and they had this issue, that issue. And it's like, you so you, it, it's like people are hearing this and, you know, formulating opinions when in reality, I guess all those things could be true. Like you just, right, you know, absolutely. so yeah, yeah very, it's, it's just very interesting, you know? Yeah. Yeah, for so. sure. How do you, so how to how can I phrase this? What do you like how did you get involved in like this clinical research clinical type research. of yeah? Well, actually, so I was a personal trainer in college. Um and I obviously I love the gym. It's a passion of mine, but I felt like it took away a lot of my passion being a personal mm -hmm. trainer. Mm -hmm. So my, my mom, um, she's in data management. So like in clinical research world, there's different departments, right? You have right. clinical monitoring, clinical operations, project management, data management. My mom's in data management and she just suggested, you know, research it, look it up and just kind of like study it a little bit, see if you're mm -hmm. interested in it. So I basically taught myself everything I need to know, like the basics of clinical research, you know, mm -hmm. um, and it was interesting to me. Um, and I like to help people. Um, and this is a way to help people in a bigger picture. I don't get to directly, you know, help. I'm not making a drug. I'm not doing, you know, but I'm making sure that good drug or bad drug is going on the market or not going on the market, you know? So right. in that way, I can still help in a bigger picture. Um, and so I kind of just researched it. I started at the bottom and I climbed my way up. I started, you know, as a, what we consider a project assistant. I did a lot of document processing. And then I like, was like, I, you know, I kind of want to be, on, I want to be on site. I want to be more involved, not, you know, behind a screen so much. Um, but I want to be like engaged with mm -hmm. the doctors and the study coordinators at the site. Cause then I feel like you have more of an in, you can build that rapport with the site. You know, you kind of, you build, um, a, a lot more that way in your career. You know, if you decided to go a different path, you have like more, you know, more right. people that you, you come in contact with. So, um, you know, this position uh, was in my five-year plan. I'm, I was blessed to get it in one year when I started, you know, trying to get this route. And um, it's been a wild ride. I've, I've, it's almost been three years and it's, it's, it's a lot, but it's, it's yeah. a lot, it's a rewarding, it's rewarding, yeah. you know. I, I can only imagine. And I mean, like you said, it's, you're not making the drug, but you're doing the the other half that's incredibly important, which is whether it goes out Absolutely. on the market, you know, it's, that's, that's almost just as important, if not ex exactly, you know, as important. So Absolutely. it's, because uh, the worst thing that could happen is, you know, bad drug go out and, and, um, you know, you hear those cases all the time, right on TV, oh, like, yeah. you know, oh, yeah. Hey, if you had recalls, this, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And in the same scenario, making sure that the patients that are in the trial, their safety and efficacy is of the utmost importance. You know, we're mm -hmm. making sure that we're not just, you know, putting their your health and safety at risk for just mm -hmm. for a drug, you know. Right. So it's yeah, it's pretty it's 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 wild, you know, yeah. like it's just it's such a big world like that industry is such a big world. I feel like you're always learning something right. new. Yeah. Yeah. Are there are there pressures there to put something on the market that absolutely okay so i was gonna go that. i was mm -hmm. gonna say that so that's the other thing making sure you run the trial and the timelines given because you know when a drug starts as a compound to the timeline of when it needs to go into the market also is the same thing with the patent so um generics can be you know brought out and you know mm -hmm. when your generic is you know released your money that you're making from you know the name brand that you are is depreciating significantly right. so it can be to the rate where you don't finish a trial when you need to and you can't put the drug on the market because you're going to lose way more money than you put into the you know into the study itself um, and that's happened many of times you know um, different companies not holding up to what they're supposed to do uh, you know I don't want to you know put put anybody on blast or or any any uh, upsetting thoughts in anybody's mind but there's yeah. like certain cures that we have found that we haven't put on the market just because timelines 
Mm. And that's so, so sad to me. That's so sad, you know? So, so what you're saying is that there's timelines where your profit like is affected. So it's yes, like, if you don't absolutely. finish by a certain time, it almost becomes worthless to put out a product absolutely. because the, the, um, what are they Other companies the generics, do the generic. Yeah. Yep. Now, now they have, now they can just put them out immediately and you have yep. no time for that to create, to yep. make that profit. That's yeah. And because so of it that, is a money market, you know, it is a yeah. money market still. It's that's a sad, sad part about it, right. but it is definitely a money market. Um, so, well, that's, you know, as America is, you know, as the world yeah. is a, a money market. So. Yeah. Well, that's the cra- the crazy part that you, that you just mentioned is, is that the fact because of that, you could have a legitimate drug that works great. Like you said, could possibly be a cure for something that doesn't get released because- And we do. Yeah. It's not It's not just one case. I mean, there's several scenarios where that's happened. Yeah. And it's so frustrating because it's a, they care about the money more, you yeah. know? Yeah. So. Yeah. That's, that's tough. That's, that's tough for someone, like you said, who, who wants to help people. It's like, you can't yep. hard to rationalize that. Like you, yeah, understand, absolutely. you know, you understand money is a, th- a thing, but it's like, but how could you withhold, you know, good from people like that? But absolutely. But world corporate America. Yeah. Yeah. yeah <laughs> unfortunately crazy. Yep. Right. Yeah. Um, so to pivot off of that, you know, you're, you're competitive, uh, you know, fitness athlete, uh, the, mm-hmm. how did you get involved in that? So I, I, I was never really an athlete growing up, but I always wanted to be, I was mm-hmm. always that, you know, like never really coordinated or any, anything like that. I did swimming. Mm-hmm. Um, so I swam, um, for 12 years, I swam in high school. And then like my first year of college, I did like club club swimming and I remember, uh, and I started lifting after some practice um, because I, um, you know, you're so exposed, right? Man. You, you, your body's so exposed. And I, you know, at that age, you're looking at other girls like, why do I look like this? And they look like that. And so I would go to the gym after some practice. And then I started getting really, you know, small. And I, I was like, oh, this is great. So I, that was my, like, my first step into the gym. And then when I got to college, um, I remember my mom being like, well, you need to choose swimming or the gym because you're doing too much. Mm-hmm. I would spend hours at the gym, you know, hours at the gym because it was like the one thing in my life that I had control over. I don't have control over much. When you're in college, you just kind of do what you, you're supposed to do and the rest falls in place. So I chose to lift, you know, um, and I focused on when I, once I got into college, learning, learning, you know, what it meant to gain muscle, to, to lift because, I had previously had an eating disorder and I, there was a pivotal moment where like my mom, I could see in her eyes, she was questioning because I didn't, it wasn't known. It was a secret, right? It was my secret. And I could see like, she's questioning me and I, I could see the hurt, you know? And I was like, I don't want to hurt her. But the one thing I always wanted was muscle. And I couldn't figure out, I was always struggling. Like, I don't get how these girls look like this. All I know to do is eat less and work more, right? And so then I was like, well, let's change this. Let's see if I can make this better. So then I learned, you know, after, you know, doing your own research, you know, bodybuilding.com and, you know, whatever you can find on Google or, you know, Instagram was just kind of starting then, you know, I I remember following um, Natalia Mello back Mm -hmm. in the day, you know, these girls that, Amanda Latona, she doesn't compete, you know, these girls um, and learning, you know, muscle and fitness for her, all these things and just learning, you know, and, and just, like realizing, oh, you know, protein, carbs, fats, you know, those are energy for your body to be able to work out. You know, you need to um, have a structure, more of a structured plan instead of just kind of lifting in the gym and not knowing what you're really doing. Um, And so from there, I just continued to lift. Um, When I graduated from college, I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to try this, like, you know, competing. And I prepped for seven weeks for my first show. I looked absolutely ridiculous but I placed third and it was the energy for me Mm -hmm. it was the energy of being on stage around like-minded people um and then I came back in 2016 did a 16-week prep myself I prepped myself up until 2019 um and I got first place in overall and it was I was like this is it Mm -hmm. I got to get better you know and so it's just been one of those things that's always stayed true with me um 
it allows me to, that's like, you know, our iron therapy, if you will, or something like after a long day of work, even if you don't want to go to the gym, when you go to the gym, it's just like this feeling you get like of just decompression and just releasing all of, you know, all of the stress, all of like what's going on in the world, all of what's going on in your world. Um, and just being, it's just you, the weight and let's go, you know? And so it's just been one of those things that's always just kind of stuck with me. You know, I, I will say, I think I'm very fortunate to have started a routine of going to the gym in high school, you know, so that when I went to college, I kept that routine. And then when I graduated from college, I kept that routine. It's just kind of been in my routine since yeah. oh, 2009 is when I got my first gym membership. So um, I think it was easier for me to continue that. You know, it's, it's hard when you get, yeah. when life gets busy, it's very easy to be like, oh, I don't have time. But it's one of those things that I always made time for, and it's just stuck with me. So, yeah, it's, it's been a, a wild ride. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting because so many uh, people that I spoke to that are in fitness and bodybuilding, like in the past, they've had dealt with issues uh, with um, uh, disorder, like eating disorders and mm-hmm. such. Is that in like what do you? I guess like what do you attribute that to? Like, do you think it's just people? wanting to look a certain way and not, uh, you know, not finding the proper route to get there. You, you mean, what do you think um, is attributing to the eating disorders they're getting while yeah. in the sport or before the sport? Well, I mean, either or, but I was, either referring, or. yeah, I was referring to before, like prior to finding yeah. bodybuilding, but. Right. So I would, I honestly, you know, if we're going to be completely transparent, it's society, right? Mm-hmm. So we have way more to look at online than we ever had before. We have commercials that without realizing are showing us this ideal look. Mm-hmm. We had, you know, back in the day we had models, Victoria's Secret model, you know, all of this stuff that women are constantly, and even men, you know, you see the um, body body magazines and all this stuff that we're looking at and everyone's, you know, glamorizing and glorifying it. And you look at yourself and you're like, that's not me. Yeah. Why can't I be like that? And I think that there's initially this, I think there's that part and then there's this need for control. And that's where mine was. I felt like I needed control somewhere. You know, I was in, um, and hi- I graduated high school with a boyfriend. I went to college with a boyfriend. It was um, very like, it was not a good relationship and I wanted control. And the only way I felt I found control was my food and my workouts. These are the two things I knew I had control no matter what, because that's mm-hmm. what I put in my mouth is what I put in my mouth and what I do with my body is, you know, what I do with my body. Right. So I think there's this sense in this need for control in our world, because sometimes we feel like our world's just so out of control that's right. that we find that one thing and we kind of just stick to it and run with it. Yeah. And then it becomes, I think that's when like the psychological part starts to kick in once they start seeing different results um whether getting smaller or more muscle or ripped or leaner or whatever it's like that psychological part starts to really start to fire yeah yeah so yeah i yeah i i I definitely agree with that what what i find is sometimes bodybuilding like in your case would like pull somebody out of like a, a eating disorder and then other times, which you mentioned just earlier, sometimes it causes it. And it's, uh, and I never quite figured out like what the, what the reason is, it, you know, it must be individual based, but, but yeah, yeah it's a, um, it's a strange effect, you know? Yeah. So I will say with bodybuilding, when you start in bodybuilding, especially if you don't have the knowledge, right. Before you even start, there's this obsessive component to it, right. And actually, that's one thing I choose not to have in my life anymore. It's this uh, obsessive component of macro counting. You know, if you have, if it fits your macros, as that's what your coach does for you, it's, you're constantly counting everything. Um, The obsessive nature of having to get your cardio done, the obsessive nature of being perfect at every single rep. And there's a lot of obsessive nature in bodybuilding, right? And if you are a perfectionist or, you know, um, a recovering perfectionist, that triggers you. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So I think bodybuilding, you have to be very careful when you start and know where your mindset is when you start and know the possibilities and also have a good support system too, to say, hey, look, I'm seeing this, you know, these trends happening with you. Like, let's, let's evaluate. Let's, let's, let's like, I reflect on what's going on. 
because it's easy to get sucked in if you are a perfectionist or a recovering per perfectionist that if you will it's easy to get sucked back in like that's your true nature right you know it's easy to be like oh i need to be 110 percent on every single thing and i don't think that's what really um i don't think that that is what breeds success always yeah you know i think i might challenge that and say to not be obsessive and still do well might be better for success because your mind is more clear Sure. You're able to live more and have more, you know, being able to have more memories and more adventures or whatever you would like to call it. Your mind is more clear. It's more, it's more readily available to when you do prep, you know, you're just more, right. I don't know. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's also, I, I get your point because it's also um, one of those things where you're like, if you're constantly obsessive and it's impossible to be perfect. And if Absolutely. you get stressed over that, then, you know, I'm sure cortisol goes up, all the stress Absolutely. hormones go up, be, everything becomes so much more difficult. But, but, when, but when you're, you know, when you're mentally kind of at peace, then, you know, you, so you make a mistake here. So you eat a little more there. So you don't lift quite the, this way today. Like you would have, you know, if you wanted to be perfect, it's not a big deal. You just come back and do it better next time, you know? And right. Right. Absolutely. I always say, you got to give yourself a little grace because we are all human. Uh, I'm not sure I could ever believe if it, that someone was 110% perfect in a prep. I don't think that's a fact. No. I think it's, it's, it's not human nature. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so, uh, you know, we do our best. We, you know, we, I always just say, give yourself a little grace. Yeah. Mistakes happen. And if you don't give yourself grace, then it's going to be a trickle effect. And then you're going to have a downward slope, Right. you know? Right. Yeah. And that, and that, that definitely is something that I see a lot of times. Like people are so obsessive that, that when they fail at being perfect, which they inevitably will, it's like, mm -hmm. it starts completely, their life starts completely unraveling, you know? And Absolutely. It's, yeah, it's a terrible thing to see. Did, um, do you have a coach now? Do you, do you, yeah. Post? So, yeah. So right now my coach is, uh, Ben Quill Marini. He is a, an IFBB men's physique pro. Um, mm -hmm. and he's with team pro ops. His team is team pro ops. Mm -hmm. Um, he's out in Kentucky right now, but he does online, online training. So. Got, it, got it. And so at, at what point did you, um, so did, was this coach with you when you got your pro card? Or was this something more recent? No. Or? Um, so I had a different coach when I won my pro card. Um, and just not, and no, no, you know, bad blood or anything mm -hmm. with them. I still think they're great people. Um, I just need it a little bit different. Um, you know, I always say, you know, every season you require something different in your life. Um, and that's okay. It's nothing wrong with that. Um, but just, I always make sure I evaluate everything first before I'm like, okay, this is what, you know, this is the route I need to take for me, you know? So, um, when I went my pro card, I was with a different coach and that was, I had never had a coach that was up to that point before I went my pro card. So I just had gotten a coach, you know, to, to, and that's when I went my pro card. Um, yeah. And then I needed more structure in the sense of like, I travel so much. Yeah. I do yeah. not need to think about what my meals look like or anything. I just need right. to pack them, freeze them, take them on the plane. Like, I don't want to think about it because I, then I do get overwhelmed. I feel yeah. overwhelmed. I'm like, I just, this is too much, you know? So yeah. having more structure and I had met Ben, um, right before I won my pro card actually, and we became really, really good friends or best friends. Um, and we have a, a lot of similar, uh, logic and, um, like thoughts and ideas on how prep should be, you know, handled mm -hmm. and stuff. And which is rare for me because I don't trust a lot of people um, just because I have a degree in exercise science. So I know mm -hmm. I probably have a little bit more knowledge than your regular athlete, which is probably a good and bad thing, you know. Right. Um, and he helped me prep through 2020 um, when I did my pro debut. And then he's been my coach since. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's interesting because because uh, you're kind of like the, my mom has this issue. She's in the medical field, and so like whenever she goes to a doctor or something, like she always like is the most difficult patient ever. <laughs> yeah, and and sometimes it's a good thing, you know, because yeah, because she's she's a proactive patient, and totally. you need to be. And then sometimes it's like it. it it's mm -hmm. like, okay, let's just let the man do his job. Like, just let the yeah. man do his Yeah, I always say I'm probably the worst athlete you'll ever have <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> because funny. I ask questions or like, 
you know, like, I just want to know, you know, because yeah. I know, you know, the process and all that stuff, you mm -hmm. know, just from not only going to college and getting a degree, but also doing it mm -hmm. myself for several years, you know? Right, right. So yeah, I always say I'm probably your worst, you know, the worst athlete to coach, <laughs> but I promise I'll be your best athlete as I can be on yeah. stage always, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. Well, that's, that's, you know, you need, you want, like I said, you want somebody that's proactive too, because, um, you, you know, no one is going to, as great of a coach you might have, and as, as much as they look out for you, no one's going to look out for you more than yourself. So, you absolutely. know, absolutely. Uh, you got to look out for yourself. Um, so we didn't discuss it, but um, just for, for the audience members, what division do you compete in? So I'm an IFB bikini pro. Okay. Um, so, and yep. so were you always a uh, bikini or did you do it? I've always been bikini. Always Everyone been. always says, are you figure? No, I'm bikini. <laughs> mm -hmm. so I've always ever, been bikini. Have you ever thought about going into figure? Well, actually, when I first started like lifting, I, I like loved Nicole Wilkins mm -hmm. like that. She was like, yes. I like mm -hmm. looked at her in awe. I was like, this mm -hmm. woman is beautiful. Like, look at her muscle, like just a very beautiful physique and, you know, face and everything. Um, and so like, I thought I wanted to figure, but I do not gain muscle that fast <laughs> or hold on to muscle that well. Right. So, um, but I always get asked sometimes figure because of my back and it's mm -hmm. probably because of swimming, right. you know, from right. swimming. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting how, like, and how like you'll develop certain muscle groups when you're young based upon your activity. Like yeah. when I was, when I was younger, I was involved in uh, wrestling, a lot of grappling mm -hmm. stuff like that. And we would do jump ropes all the time. So in those formative years, I did a lot of jumps. So my calves are huge, you know, and yeah. it's like, and it, I, I just find that amazing that like, if you can, if you can start training, like at that younger age, like you can kind of like develop your physique in such a way where later on it stays, you know, stays yeah. with. So it's almost like muscle memory, you know? Right. Right. So in your yeah. case, you were swimming. So your back is yeah. you know, always that good, you know, no matter what. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Try to hide it on stage, you know, but yeah. yeah. Um, how how uh, do you think um, over the years, have you seen like bikini change? Like, the Oh, for thing? sure. What oh, for think? sure. If I brought my very first package to a, a regional show now, hey, no way I would have gotten third place, mm -hmm. you know? And then even I would, I would even go for as far to say if I brought the package I brought in 2016 when I won the overall, 2017 when I won, you know, two first place, I still wouldn't place as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I say that, you know, not, you know, not in a mean way, but that's just how much it's developed. These girls are coming out hot, yeah. coming out hot. And I think speak, the reason being is, the knowledge in their resources and, you know, we're starting to have a spotlight on us a little bit more. So as a sport, you know, um, the education level, I mean, even the, my degree, I guarantee if I went back to school today and did my, re did my whole entire degree, I would be learning completely different yeah. than how I learned it when I was there. So our knowledge base is, you know, is broad and in, in such a good way, you know, it's not a one size fits all anymore. It's not a, mm -hmm. you know, you need to eat chicken, rice and broccoli, you know, and do 50 minutes of cardio. It's, it's everybody's, we're learning, we're learning adaptability and everybody's body is different. And I think it's, I think it's incredible. Right. I think it's awesome to watch it, you know, change and develop. Yeah, that, I mean, definitely way more developed than like a few years ago, and all the divisions really across the absolutely, board. Absolutely, absolutely. So, in the physique itself, um, you know, I don't, I'm not want to put words in your mouth, but is it um, is you feel like they're more muscular? Like, are you are you saying the conditioning is better, or, or kind of everything? All I would say both. Actually, I would yeah. say both. I think I, I, I'll also say this. I feel like when I started competing, there's a lot more young muscle. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as much mature muscle, right? So um, now you're starting to see athletes, old retired or ex gymnasts, ex you know um, lacrosse player, soccer player, you know all these that have that athletic background. Mm -hmm. Now they're doing this, you know this this um, this sport, and they're bringing you know their background athleticism into the sport, which is a huge foundation to have, right? I feel like at first people like you know people that played sports you know, team sports didn't think twice about, you know, but, you know, but they just went and went and lift lifted, um, like they would as if they were still a player on a team. Right. Um, but I think, um, now you're seeing more developed physiques. You're seeing, mm -hmm. um, we're learning how to 
you know, make sure our muscles stay full. We're learning how to, um, you know, grow that muscle, the, you know, the specific muscle needed, you know, mm -hmm. for whatever criteria. We're learning also how to get conditioned, you know, you know, our workouts aren't the same anymore for right. everybody. It's not, again, not a one size fits all plan anymore. It's right. this person might need to do hit cardio and this other person might need to do steady state because of the way their physiques develop and what they have and they, or they don't have, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think um, with the knowledge that we've just, you know, in the past, I would say three to five years mm -hmm. have gained in this industry, the physiques are insane. Even when they're first timers, you know, doing their first show as a novice mm -hmm. or, you know, maybe this is their fourth show. It's incredible to watch athletes change, you know, from their first show to their third show or girls are coming in doing their first regional show then going to their first national show getting their pro card and placing top 10 at their pro debut yeah. you know so yeah. like i think the knowledge is a huge thing yeah you know adaptability yeah. and making sure it, it's it's um customized per the individual for sure right yeah well that's that's where you were where you were speaking about earlier um as far as like social media like on one hand what we were talking about earlier was a you know a negative but sometimes it's a positive right sometimes absolutely sometimes by so a lot of um you know bodybuilders a lot of competitors have tremendous followings and now like people are seeing them and it allows them to like push themselves whereas before if you didn't, you know, go to your local gym and you didn't see somebody with a great physique, you wouldn't necessarily have anything to look at and strive towards. Absolutely. You know? And now you have kids, um, you know, and again, this is the positive viewpoint of it is that you can look at somebody and be like, okay, well, that guy looks like that or that girl looks like that and she deadlifts or he deadlifts this much. So I'm going to go and I'm going to deadlift and I'm going to get better. And I'm, you know, and it's, so it's Absolutely. kind of, we, I had a conversation with my wife. It's like, I don't want to, and I know this sounds kind of superficial, but I wouldn't want to go to a gym where I'm like, where I have the best physique. Like, or, yeah. you know, I want to go to, to a gym where people look better than me, you know? And it's because it's I want to look at some motivating thing. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Especially yeah. when you're tired. <laughs> yes. Yes. Especially when you're tired. Yes. Because it's like, because if you're the best you know, person in the gym, uh, whether it's a sport or whether it's bodybuilding, it's like, you, you kind of like, well, I can skip, you know, I don't have to go as hard because I already, you know, I'm already the best, you know, what, what do I need to work hard for? Is, right. You know? and, right. It's almost like that peripheral of like, oh, you know, I see them. I need right. to set my game up, you know? Right. Absolutely. And also, uh, you were mentioning talking about uh, coming from other sports. That's the other part is now because of the tremendous following the fitness athletes have, you have people that are used to be athletes. They're not professionals. Like let's say you used to play baseball or basketball, whatever. And, uh, you're not good enough to go pro or, or maybe even college, you know, but you're still very athletic. So what do you do? Well, I'm going to try out bodybuilding, you know, I'm going to try out. Yeah, and that's what happens a lot of times. So now you have these people coming in with, you know, tremendous genetics and then, you know, and the knowledge that you were talking about earlier. So they, you said adding that. Hold on. Oh, can you hear me? For some reason, my headphones aren't working. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, that was weird. They just cut out for some reason. Oh, no worries. So yeah, I was just saying that like it, to your point about the knowledge. So you have these knowledge, yeah. And you and then the knowledge that they're getting yeah. nowadays, it's combining together to create these like incredible physiques. Absolutely. Know? It's I'm, it amazes me every time. I'm like, wow. Yeah. You know, and especially when they have that structure, that foundation, and then yeah. they come in, like they already have this foundation, right? Right. Like they can only like they're only gonna keep go going up, going up yeah. here. Yeah. And it's it's like insane to me. Like yeah. I I was just skinny. I was skinny, uh, if you want to call it for lack of a better term, skinny fat. Mm -hmm. I was never a muscular girl. I mm -hmm. had to really work to build muscle. I had to right. eat. I had to lift heavy weights. Like I don't people probably don't realize like some people don't have to lift heavy to grow mm -hmm. their muscle. That's their body type, right? I had to lift heavy, yeah. heavy to build my body. Yeah. And that's just my physique, right? That's everyone, again, like it's adaptability to each person is different. Um, and that's how we're learning to structure, yeah. you know, our days, our, you yeah. know, our lifestyle, yeah. you know, what we want to be and what we don't 
Right. What do you think about about like different divisions and everything being added? You know, every so often they add a few more divisions. But recently they added wellness. wellness. Like what are your like what is your viewpoint of that all, you know, altogether for the sport? I think it's a good thing for the sport. I think the most right now for the most part it's a money maker for the sport. But I think for women, if you look at anatomy, right? Like on paper, women are gonna be bottom heavy. And that's mm -hmm. just that, like a normal female is typically going to have thicker legs than not. Mm -hmm. And I think that gives, um, it gives more room for others to not kill themselves trying to get into bikini or not kill themselves trying right. to get into figure. And it gives like that middle ground. Mm -hmm. Like, it, again, you have to come in conditions. You have to be in shape. You have to be lean. You have to have that fullness, that, you know, size and right. where, where it's required, right? But like for me, I'm a very proportionate person. Again, I didn't have muscle to start. So when I built, it was very right. just top to bottom, um, you know, but for most girls, especially like if you're a soccer player, like your legs are not going to be small right. like nine times out of 10. Right. And it's going to be really hard to change that because they already had that foundation. Yeah. They already had that foundation of a lot of leg work, a lot of, you know, muscle building to be a good soccer player, right. for example. Yeah. And so it gives them that chance to be a part of something, you know, this community where they right. fit in. Um, I think it's good. I think it gives people, again, because there are so many different body types in this world, it gives more people the room to be in this sport, in this community, mm -hmm. and feel like they belong, you know, and yeah. feel like they fit somewhere and where they're not killing themselves. Right. Like for trying, trying to kill themselves to get their legs to shrink. Yeah. When that's just not what their body wants. Yeah, you know? yeah. So it makes yeah. it more healthy in a sense if you think about it. You know, you do what's best for your body and what's best for your shape. Right. And you do that category because it makes sense for you. Right, right. Yeah. Cause I mean, I was just talking to uh, a figure competitor just before you, and we were, she was mentioning that all the other divisions are like balanced. Like every other division is kind of balanced top to bottom. Wellness is the only one that allows their lower half to be bigger. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, I think I think there's something to be, well, it already had a tremendous following before it got yeah. to that ABB. So now it's just continuing to pick up. It's like all yeah. the rage, you know, and um, and then just allows these women to, you know, a, a, a place, you know, in this. Yeah, world. I mean, I you, I can bet you you can ask twenty bikini competitors or ex bikini competitors what was the hardest thing for you, and right. nine times out of ten they're going to say to bring my legs down, to bring my legs down right. because again, anatomically and naturally, girls have legs. Right, like that's right. just how our structure. You know, as we grow older, it's very rare that you see someone you know, proportionate top to bottom is hard. It's hard, right, you know, right. and it just gives them a space to be competitive, to be an athlete, to work out and use the stage, you know, as a goal, not yeah. an end goal. Cause I don't believe in end goals. I think it's not fair to say this is my end goal. Cause we always want to be better, right. but just, you know, have something in sight that they can work towards, you know? Sure. Sure. And yeah. And I, I mean, and the other thing is how good are you going to be if you're forcibly like over, I mean, everyone is leaning out and, and shrinking, but if you're sure. if you're a, like doing it to that degree where you have to just you know starve your your legs down, how good are you going to be? You're not going to be and you're as not. good as someone who's genetically inclined to look Absolutely. like that. And so, because then when they're dieting that way, they can't you can't fat reduce, fat right, reduce, right? Right. So your upper body is also going to shrink, shrink too, too. You know, so you're just going to look very tiny. Yep. Your yep. proport again, your proportions are your proportions. Yeah. You can tell someone not to train legs and never train legs and only do cardio and upper body. It your proportions are your proportions. Right, right. It's you it's, know what I mean. Yeah, it's gonna be impossible to do that. So yeah, definitely like more divisions, I do think is a huge benefit. Plus, yep. you know, it creates more stars. More stars create Absolutely. Really help the help the sport. Help the, you know, yep. Yeah. So it, it makes things more attainable, is what yeah. my biggest thing is. It makes you know, it makes it more attainable for the different types of people that there are in this world. Sure. Which sure. is fair, which is fair. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I don't think you should, if the, like, so obviously sports, you know, you have levels of where people are elite, right? But yeah. I don't think that it should, you should create only one division 
and like you know just for everyone i think there should be multiple that's right. why you know that's why you don't have uh you know boxers all in the same weight class right or you have fighters in the same weight class there's different ones it wouldn't make sense right you yeah it wouldn't make you, sense you wouldn't have um you wouldn't have like a heavyweight fight a lightweight it doesn't make any sense like yeah. you said. so so but you know i feel like we should think about bodybuilding the same way we don't necessarily have weight classes although some you know some divisions some do too. yeah yeah but if we look at our bodies, you know, structurally, we're all different. So you should Absolutely. have, you should have separation where people's structures can be, can be, adjust, you know, like can be addressed, so to speak. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. So what are your, um, uh, what are your goals as far as like this upcoming, um, you know, I don't know for, for the rest of this year and then maybe next year, like, what are you thinking? Well, right now I'm top of the list for Olympia points. So mm. my goal right now is to keep keep on keep the it. list. Yeah. Um, I have done seven shows this year, so I'm a little. Uh, I was like last week. I was I was I was useless. I was yeah. so dead. But um, I feel actually today I woke up and I feel my mind feels you know recharged. My body feels recharged. Cardio didn't kill me you know yeah. so and I would say I'm very fortunate this year I we did a really good off season uh, it wasn't long but it was just perfect enough for me yeah. to um refuel and everything where like this prep I ate you know I I've I've, I've been very fortunate you know a lot of times mm. you hear girls are on low carbs blah blah, blah. Right. I only had to do that for three days you know mm. this whole prep and I've been prepping wow. since February January February that's amazing so I've been yeah, yeah so I've been very fortunate um I am tired though. Uh, I think my body and my mind needs just a little bit of a break. Um, you know, I might jump on a show again before the Olympia, um, but obviously my bet, my goal right now is to bring my best physique to the Olympia stage yeah. because that's where we want to shine the most, right? Right. So that's, that's my goal for this year. Yeah, that's exciting because I mean, you're you know to to get there. It's tough with uh, you know oh, yeah. with with so many bikini competitors. It's tough so you know, to many. be. To be on top uh, on top of that list is a huge deal. Well, I, I'm, I'm, yeah. I wish you well. Um, so, you. If, if someone um, wanted to like reach out to you, whether they want some maybe help with uh, training or dieting, or just want to pick your mind about like about competing, uh, what would be the best way that they could uh, reach out to you? Absolutely. So Instagram's my best way. Um, it's mm -hmm. ifbb pro underscore sierra swan, and it's two yeah. ends. Um, and I do posing. So that's another way. If you just DM me, you can, um, we can talk about posing too. Um, right. I'm, I typically, if someone asks me for like, you know, diet or, or, um, training program, I mm -hmm. usually like, you know, you know, give them a suggestion. Cause my time right now is very I limited. Of um, course. but, um, I, I don't mind answering questions, you know, if they just mm -hmm. have, you just have a question regarding, you know, what you know diet or like you know training if they have questions about it mm -hmm. you know i don't mind answering those questions at all awesome well sarah thank you so much for your time i don't want to take up any more of your time but i appreciate uh you speaking uh, not just about like training and working out and competing but also uh you know the the clinical research as well that's extremely interesting so Absolutely. so I, I appreciate it. you take care have a great rest of the night all right thank you so much i appreciate all it right, take care all right bye